Hi everyone and welcome to this long form teaching video for a left cartilage moringoplasty which is presented as a endoscopic and microscopic case. This 24 year old patient had a traumatic tympanic membrane perforation with some antero superior tympanosclerosis and on preoperative audiometry there was a conductive hearing loss noted as well as a type B tympanogram. Here we present the operating room setup for our left ear with the cautery, the drill, as well as the camera and the facial nerve monitor all at the foot of the patient and a microscope always present in the room and significant space under the table for the surgeon's leg if they choose to sit down. The preoperative preparation is, has been begun by our fellow Ben here who's prepared things for us and we can see a Merisil Odewick is required for the canal packing, as well as these 3 mil 1% Repivacaine injections mixed to 1 in 50,000 adrenaline for injection and 1 in 1,000 adrenaline drawn up topically for the Odewick. We can also see the leukoplast and the facial nerve monitor. The injecting needle is beveled to 15 degrees to face down towards the bony canal and the injection is begun after preparing the ear with leucoplast tape around the ear and the head is taped down to the bed. Here we use a speculum. Ideally a black one would be used here but we're using a silver one and there is a slow single point injection with the bevel down onto the bone and the pressure on the speculum is significant medially to allow infusion of the local anesthetic medially and here you can see with magnification blanching of the skin and swelling of the skin superiorly. The injection is done slowly, as I mentioned. Once this is all blanched, attention's turned to the tragal cartilage. And what I do here is use my thumb to roll the tragus anteriorly and then place the posterior aspect on view. And once again, injection just under the skin between the soft tissue and the perichondrium. And then a small amount of local anesthetic is instilled in the posterior superior quadrant of the ear canal where we're placing another Lone Star. And then I use my index finger over the tympanomastoid suture and a postericular block, a regional block is applied and this finger is there to prevent any local anesthetic going over the facial nerve. We then start uh, set up for the ear and I place the odor wick in the ear canal with one in a thousand adrenaline to topicalize the ear canal as I scrub for the case and as the preparation and draping is performed. So this is a large Merisil odor wick with the one in a thousand adrenaline. We then prep the ear with standard betadine solution. And the Merisil odor wick is removed and a syringe with betadine is used to fill the ear canal. This can be half strength betadine if you choose. We then have the draping to occur and this is obviously the ear is dried and then draping occurs and we use an eye band to cover the whole sterile area. And you can see here fairly precise draping around just the ear to expose just the ear itself. And then the eye band is placed over the ear canal. And subsequently, if we're doing underwater drilling, we would place a urology or a handbag under there to catch water. But in this case, there won't be much drilling. So just the eye band is placed and the anti-fog is placed to the left-hand side of the ear here so that no anti-fog actually falls into the ear canal because as you know, the anti-fog is ototoxic. Here I'm showing you how to apply the Lone Stars and we use the blue low profile Lone Stars. And the first one's placed on the tragus and take note that we want to avoid the orbital socket. So of course we feel for the orbital socket and place the tragal one above the orbital socket or below the orbital socket. And then a second Lone Star retractor postro superiorly to straighten out the ear canal. And the third one on the anti-tragus to allow the whole ear canal, particularly the lateral meatal tissues, to be on tension. Here's the general microscopic setup with a neutral cervical spine and I use this to prepare the ear canal and I'm sucking very carefully around the hairs here so that they stand on end so that we can quite easily cut them at their bases with this limpet oral speculum. And so the limpet oral st speculum stretches the ear canal in four quadrants and we use the Bellucci scissors from lateral to medial. 
in four quadrants. Here superiorly, then we'll move to whichever you choose, but here it's anterior, and then posterior and inferior. And in this antero superior aspect where hairs are is quite important. It's a common site where the odd hair will be left behind and it will scrape your camera and really annoy you with the endoscopic case. So important to uh, do this and also spend some time cleaning out the ear with irrigation. Here we have the final general overview for a hybrid endoscopic microscopic setup with the microscope always balanced and draped. And then the hand position with the light lead going up between my index and middle finger. But try different uh, options for, your, for yourself uh, when you're beginning endoscopic ear surgery. You can see here that we have the ear canal now prepared. You can see the, the uh, small bleb superiorly from the injection. And I'm using a round knife very gently over the skin to clean the wax, and then we clean the ear canal and suction the middle ear. And the case has begun with a rosin needle, and of course here what we're doing is rimming the perforation to allow bleeding and then subsequent near vascularization to occur. And you can see here that initially we're postage stamping and then I'm demonstrating also a method where we try and tear along the perforation here, down onto the inferior aspect. This can possibly be done all in one go and spinning the rosin needle around to get an inferior view. There's too much blood, so I move superiorly here towards the umbo. And care needs to be taken near the umbo, of course, as uh, it's quite a delicate area. So once this has all been stripped, then we use cups or alligator forceps to strip the rim of the perforation, and this will allow new vessel growth in this region. And of course, the classic side of failure is antero superiorly, so we need to get good bleeding at an antero superiorly. Then we begin our uh, beaver blade incisions at six to seven o'clock. And an important point is that the beaver blade is parallel to the annulus, not tangential, so that as we elevate the annulus, it doesn't tear across our incisions. And the superior incisions at 10 to 11 o'clock to allow the flap to be based at the anterior tympanomiatal angle, so the anteroinferior part, the angle that's most acute, the area that we want to avoid for blunting. Here we're using a sucker just to get a careful view of where the lateral incisions are going to be placed, and then we move to a angled beaver blade, and this is placed precisely over the inferior and then the superior incision, with care sometimes required over the vascular strip, where sometimes we need to re-incise over the vascular strip. This is a very thin vascular strip here, but it can be quite fibrous and vascular and require quite firm hand force to incise through the vascular strip. And then I typically use a half by half neuropatty or a quarter by quarter neuropatty. And this is soaked in one in a thousand adrenaline with the string still attached which can allow us to quickly insert and remove the neuropatties. It's important when you're manipulating neuropatties in the external canal and around the middle ear that you're very gentle on the ossicle. So you can see there's not a lot of force with these neuropatties and we place them just beyond the incision line to allow the blood to drip down onto them. And you can see it's just beyond the incision line to catch the blood and there's quite typically annoying bleeding at the postro inferior site here that sometimes requires a bipolar to stop. You can see here the incision line just here, and I'll begin with a round knife. And this is slowed down for training purposes, but you can see that we're essentially using a round knife. A suction round knife can be used in this instance. I prefer not to use them as I find the suction area is a fair distance from the dissection area and, and the lateral tissue often gets sucked in. And here is sometimes a stubborn area near the vascular strip region that requires several incisions and sometimes a Bellucci scissors to cut through this tissue. But you can see the tissue is very thin here and easily is elevated. Here's a nice little tip where we're folding the neuropathy, initially placing it over the post incision and then folding the edge of it over so that it can be used as a dissection technique. So here I'm dissecting down with the neuropathy catching the blood and then you'll see in a moment that the free edge that's lateral to the round knife can be flipped down and we can press firmly on that free edge and use that to dissect down on 
the bone preserving the skin of the tympanomiatal flap. And I'm looking for the posterior notch of rivenous and the annulus. And of course, we're looking for a external canal quarter as well, which is a rare variant, but sometimes seen. So it's quite uh, easy to elevate this using the neuropathy. And remember, don't be shy to use several neuropathies. You can see the, that I have to reincise some of the tissue superiorly near the vascular strip here. And take your time when you're doing your first tympanomiatal flap elevations when you're doing endoscopic ear surgery. It is an area that often for established microscopic surgeons is quite a frustrating area, but it's worthwhile taking time to cut the hair and to deliber deliberately slowly work in the ear canal. It develops that lovely hand-eye coordination that you require as you move into the middle ear. So here we're removing some of the bloodied neuropathies and placing fresh ones in there to target the annulus now. So we'll be aiming to target the area at the posterior notch of rivenous where the annulus starts to fade away and where the posterior malleolar fold region crosses over the chorda tympani. And you can see some fresh quarter by quarter neuropathies that we suction on. And then soon I'll be able to see the posterior notch of rivenous and my quarter tympani. So I'll place this neuropathy down there and I'll get the round knife once again down there. And soon you'll be able to see the annulus and the quarter tympani. And of course, you want to get a very nice view of this. And one of the strengths of the endoscope, particularly posterior and furially, when there is a big overhang, is you can often deliberately see the annulus, which you can't see when you're doing this microscopically. And you can easily start to see the annulus now as I'm elevating this. A little bit of blood, which is a little bit more than I'd like, but I can easily see the annulus now, so I don't need to switch to the microscope at this stage. And you can see here the point I was making of a parallel incision, where when I'm pushing, the incision's staying away from the annulus, so it doesn't tear across the annulus here and the mucosa is being elevated here and we can start to see our quarter tympani coming up postero lateral uh, sorry postero superiorly with a attached long type configuration this is a classification published by Uranaka at our last year quite a useful classification for you to record your cases with and see if there's any correlation to quarter injury so you can see here now that we're starting to now approach the handle of the malleus and we'll use this technique where we use cups, quite an unusual method for an otologist to use cups and pull tissue, but we're grabbing the tissue just lateral to Prusak space, the tympanomiatal flap, and pulling that antro inferiorly and that will open up Prusak space and you can start to see the posterior malleolar ligament and fold and a better view of the quarter. We ideally want to see the cartilaginous cap over the short process of the malleus. Not easily seen in this case, but in most cases we can get a very nice view of that. And when we break off that cartilaginous cap, that breaks us into the periosteal plane of the handle of the malleus, allowing us to more neatly dissect the periosteum off as a glove off the handle of the malleus. But we can get a better view of the quarter tympani here in the incodostopedial joint. I'll start the dissection with a sickle knife but soon you'll see that this will be very unsatisfactory for me. It's, not, it's a very loose acicular chain and there's a little bit too much blood. I can't see what's going on. So soon I'll switch to the microscope. So I'll flip my tympanomiatal flap up so that I have the rotation points at 6 o'clock and at 10 o'clock. And this places the dissection area, which is the handle of the malleus and the umbo, on relief so that this is the area which I can see most acutely relative to the flap angulation. And once I have this flap up, then I'll switch to the microscope and I'll show you a couple of things that I like with the microscope here that's very nice uh, when we're dissecting the handle of the malleus. Here, there was a little bit of blood posterior inferiorly and quite a thick fibrous band of mucosa, which I couldn't see clearly with the endoscope. So I lift that up with my sucker and use a Belushi to cut that thickened mucosa. So just a way that we can get around the disadvantage of not seeing well with blood and with the endoscope. I mean, certainly you can do this with the endoscope, it just takes a bit longer. With the handle of the malleus, we can place the sucker very gently at the umbo region, or even on the medial aspect of the mid shaft of the malleus, and place it on the promontory or just in front of the oval window. And this allows me to stabilize the handle of the malleus, and more comfortably allows me to dissect the periosteum 
off the handle of the malleus in a safe way so that we're not causing too much excursion of the acicular chain and obviously risking sensorineural hearing loss. So you can he see here I'm stabilizing the handle of the malleus with the sucker either in the mid shaft or at the umbo. As I approach the umbo, as you know, the fibrous layer gets more adherent and more attached, and soon you'll see a magnified view here. And what I'm doing is clearing the epithelium off the lateral surface of the umbo so that I'm sure that this is just fibrous layer of the drum. And then we'll switch to a Bellucci scissors and start from posteriorly and then inferiorly and finally anteriorly to actually cut the fibrous layer off the umbo region of the malleus. This is quite an adherent, difficult malleus stripping. You could argue that we could do an underlay here, but I was concerned because of the tympanosclerosis antra superiorly that it might fail at the junction there anteriorly. So I'm stripping the handle of the malleus so we can get cartilage all the way up antro superiorly in the graft. And so here you can see fine straight Belucci's cutting posteriorly, then inferiorly and finally anteriorly so that we're confident that all of the epithelium has been removed from the umbo. If you're concerned here, you can of course switch to a laser and just laser the tip of the umbo. Another important point here is to use the short Thomason to lift this mucosa antro superiorly. It's an important point to lift all of this mucosa up and show the lateral aspect of the protympanum so that you can quite confidently place your graft in that region under the tympanic membrane. You can start to see some of the protympanum coming into view there. An important point, and that's actually where we'll be placing the cartilage graft. So you can see the cleared space here, as I mentioned before. Now, what we'll do is we will just give the ear a bit of a wash and a clean and just demonstrate a couple of simple points of anatomy. I didn't want to manipulate the acicular chain too much here, so not much to see. But a couple of little tips to show you, particularly the beginners with tympanoplasty and our trainees. But here we're suctioning the middle ear. And an important point about suctioning blood in the middle ear, we want to obviously avoid the round window in this region and avoid bumping the acicular chain. So here I'm lifting the tympanomiatal flap up so that it'll allow me to actually tuck the cartilage graft into that space that I mentioned, lateral to the malleus and medial to the lateral aspect of the protympanum. And I'm sucking, and you'll see here, I'll be very careful and gentle around the round window and avoid sucking too much around the round window because, of course, it's possible to perforate the round window membrane there if you're a very aggressive. We can see the fustus here demonstrated and the, and the uh, ponticulus that will show up in a moment here. And then what I'll do is you can quite clearly see an open primary isthmus, but I'll get a 30 degree angle to scope to demonstrate the open isthmus as well as some couple of points of anatomy in the protympanum. We can see the protoniculum that's highlighted soon, the ridge that separates the protympanum from the hypotympanum, and then likely the opening to the eustachian tube here just illustrated in this area. But you can see there's no obstruction in that region, so we're ready now to measure the graft. And I use a long Thomason to measure. So here we're trying to place the knuckle of the measurer at the posterior bony annulus, and the anterior aspect is going well up and applying itself to the lateral surface of the protympanum. And it measures approximately one and a half lengths of the Thomason antro posteriorly, and approximately one and a quarter lengths of the Thomason superior inferiorly. So you can see here again, I'll firmly rotate up to feel the lateral aspect of the hypotympanum here. And you can see that the knuckle of the Thomason comes to the midpoint of the malleus. So I extend that by about a quarter to cover the short process of the malleus and some of that region where the tympanomial flap's been elevated. So then we put a neuropathy in the area and we're ready to harvest our tragal cartilage. So let's move to that. I move back to the microscope for this. And as I mentioned to you, I use the thumb to rotate the cartilage forward. And we want to make an incision with a 15 blade, preserving a one to two millimeter strip for cosmetic reasons. And we try and do a single incision through the skin, through the soft tissue, through the thin perichondrium, the cartilage and the thick perichondrium. Ideally, that would be done in one incision here. I'm uh, fiddling a little bit to extend the incisions superiorly and inferiorly. And then the Lone Star becomes very useful to help as a retractor here. So the Lone Star goes again back in to help with retraction. And I can use tooth adsin forceps 
to retract the soft tissue posteriorly and then fine sharp curved iris scissors to cut through the soft tissue preserving the soft tissue posteriorly and leaving getting into the dissection plane between the soft tissue and the thin concave perichondrium which is posterior this thin concave perichondrium which is posterior becomes the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane it's possible to separate the perichondrium from the cartilage and place the perichondrium on the cartilage in a second operative step but i prefer to leave the perichondrium in place and we try and dissect down to the medial margin of the tragus we need a near total composite cartilage graft here so i'll be exposing the tragal cartilage almost down to the tympanic ring and then you see how my ring finger is rotating the tragus forward and then i'm getting into the plane between the pre auricular soft tissue and the thick perichondrium on the convex side of the tragus so here the anterior tragal dissection is done with non-tooth forceps and again the curved iris and i replace the lone star and you can see it provides excellent exposure when you manipulate the lone star quite nicely and if you stay in the right plane there's minimal bleeding in this sort of situation so it's always nice to have minimal bleeding because we can see very precisely where we're cutting. And once again, we're heading towards the tympanic ring here. We want to try and get as medial as we can on the tragal cartilage so that we have a nice superior inferior aspect and dimension to our cartilage graft. And then pushing and spreading. And then we release the free superior margin, superiorly as high as we can, superior as we can. And then the thicker inferior contiguous margin is pulled superiorly and then we cut that as inferiorly as possible. So this is trying to maximize the cartilage graft as much as possible. And you can see this is again slowed down for teaching purposes, but we end up with quite a nice substantial graft. And this is a graft that should fit most tympanic membrane sizes and distances. So the tragal cartilage, when it's in virgin territory, provides an excellent graft material. And then, of course, we're transecting medially almost at the tympanic ring. You can see here the full graft and not a lot of bleeding in the tragal harvesting site. Now, the long thomason is used for a second time to check the AP distance and then the superior inferior distance with the thick perichondrium anteriorly on the convex side. Tension will then be turned to the tragal wound. Judicious cautery should be used here, and of course bipolar with a setting around six. Usually no cautery or minimal cautery is required. And then I use a 5-0 vical rapide with a vertical mattress suture. And here what we're trying to do is come into the incision line at around 45 degrees and close the dead space as best as we can. And usually two or three sutures are required to close this dead space and that should be all that's required to successfully close the tragal cartilage space and this is a very uncommon site of bleeding you can see here we have three sutures in place here and then a nice little tip is to replace the lone star back onto the wound and this allows a little bit more tamponading of the area So we can see back returning to the hand position for fashioning grafts done on a mayo or hand table with a neutral cervical spine once again. Please take note of that. And now the cartilage dissection is tend to, we tend to prefer this on a of course a cutting block. And we're noting the thick perichondrium on the convex anterior side and the thin perichondrium on the posterior concave side, which will become the lateral aspect of the graft. So thick anterior, thin posterior. The graft will be lateral like this, and this anterior thick perichondrium can be used for tuck grafts sometimes when we need that between the tympanic membrane and the graft itself. So we begin the dissection by removing the thick perichondrium so we can preserve this for potential tuck grafts. I often start the dissection with a sharp round knife and then move to curved iris scissors because this can very quickly allow the dissection plane to be explored. A few little tips here when we have 
older patients, this cartilage graft is particularly brittle. And there may also be two or three can uh, two or three gaps in the cartilage for uh, neural and vascular supply. And the fishes of Santorini sometimes. can hold us back in this region. The last remaining thick perichondrium can often be peeled and stripped off down to its contiguous end here. And then I typically use an 11 blade to trim the thick perichondrium here to try and avoid any irregular edges to the thick perichondrium, partly for aesthetic reasons, but just in case we actually need it to place to cover any bare bone or if we need a large tuck graft then it's good not to have little pieces because it allows neat epithelial migration from the edge of the perforation onto the thin perichondrium of the lateral surface of the cartilage graft and then we're measuring the graft for the third time once again ap one and a half superior one and a quarter like this and this will likely be the position of the graft with the anterior edge and the inferior edge demonstrated here and then when we flip the graft over, the inferior edge is now at the inferior margin of the screen and the anterior edge to the right. And then now I'm starting to cut the edges of the cartilage graft using a sharp 3 millimeter round knife, beveling the edges at 45 degrees. And this allows the perichondrium and the cartilage graft to curve laterally. And the advantage of this is that when you're placing it into the middle ear, the perichondrium and the cartilage tends to apply itself to the to the lateral aspect of the protympanum and the hypotympanum and then the retrotympanum. So it tends to do the job of trying to close that gap. And here we're now moving towards the superior margin of the graft with the same 45 degree angling and beveling of the round knife. And remember to preserve these cartilage offcuts. This These may be useful if there's a large gap between the graft and the tympanic membrane perforation margin where we can provide a strut graft in the middle ear to support the graft in the middle ear. You can see the curled edges that I mentioned to you before of the cartilage and the perichondrium in this view. Then we're rechecking where the posterior cuts will be and then reaffirming where those incisions will be through and removing this posterior cartilage graft. And these, these bits of cartilage I'll keep for strut grafts once again. When you're doing these incisions, it's important to avoid firm force through the cartilage as this may tear through the periosteum, oh, sorry, the perichondrium. It's not the end of the world, but certainly nice to keep it all contiguous. So here we're very gently lifting that uh, cartilage off and that will be potentially a nice strut graft if we need in the hypotympanum to prop up that anteroinferior part of the graft or the antero superior part of the graft that often falls back. And here's the posterior superior edge that might drape over the ossicles that I've illustrated here. So once again, using the round knife, and uh, this is now reasonably stubborn here, so I'll hold on to the perichondrium as it's quite stuck in this region and awkward to use scissors here as we don't want to lose the length of the perichondrium. Quite stubborn here, so I'm holding on to the perichondrium to keep that cartilage intact. And as I mentioned to you, keep these bits of cartilage in case we need them. And noting the careful counter-traction, and you'll see eventually this cartilage does come off. Now we have the graft prepared for its initial placement. And I'm looking at the graft and just eyeballing it, and it seems to me that uh, the point where the umbo is, which is is around where I've got the round window, uh, where the round knife is marked. So we may need to remove a strip more to allow the cartilage to sit in front of the handle of the malleus and below the umbo. And this was an eyeball measuring, just from experience. Uh, but certainly you could place the cartilage graft in and see, but likely you would find that you'd have to remove a strip of cartilage once again. So this is the classic Pac-Man graft that we talk about that's fashioned to this patient's ear. So now we're left with several cartilage struts, the thick perichondrium for tuck grafts, and then the cartilage 
composite cartilage graft all in one position. And this is likely the way it'll go in with anterior edge, inferior edge, and posterior superior edge to drape over the ossicles. Then we cover that with a wet ray tech as we're preparing the ear to insert. I prefer to use a speculum to insert to avoid any squamous epithelium coming in with the large grafts. And you can see I'm targeting that area lateral to the malleus and medial to the protympanum lateral aspect or the medial edge of the tympanic membrane perforation. And I'll grab that cartilage and place it quite deliberately into that area. And you can see I'm quite carefully targeting. I've just targeted that area and got and slotted it into that region. And you'll see this thin perichondrium can be draped posterolaterally. But you'll notice that when I push it in, it doesn't seem to sit nicely posteroinferiorly, and it appears to be a little bit too big posteroinferiorly. And another point is that you can see the cartilage graft is not sitting in front of the handle of the malleus. So I push this in front of the handle of the malleus. You can see the incastopedial joint fairly clearly there. And then when I relook at the posteroinferior margin, you'll see that it's uh, sitting a little bit, a little bit flatter. I'm happier now that this cartilage is in front of the handle of the malleus and below the umbo now, and the cartilage still, still seems to be poking out a little bit but I'll try and place that down with a drum elevator. You can see here it's poking down a bit. I'll relay this thin perichondrium over the ossicles. You'll see it doesn't actually touch the ossicles because it's tented by the memory of the cartilage and it sits over the scutal bone. So I'll try and push that down with a drum elevator. And I'm just ensuring, double checking that it's sitting in the right position below the umbo. And then we move to an endoscope to check the position of the anterior aspect of the graft, which we can't see easily with the microscope. And so we switch to the endoscope in this situation and use the sucker to replace the tympanomiatal flap. And I'll look now carefully at the anterior margin of the tympanic membrane perforation, and I'll likely see that there is a little gap there. You'll see there's a small gap of around two millimeters here. So... I decide to demonstrate to you a strut graft and a tuck graft. So I'll use the drum elevator to lift up the composite cartilage graft. And then we use one of those cartilage offcuts. And I'll place that on the anterolateral aspect of the promontory to lateralize that antro inferior part of the composite cartilage graft. And this is called a cartilage strut graft. So you can see I'll use one of those struts that we can place in there. And this goes into the middle ear itself. And assuming that it gets its blood supply by osmosis, it'll likely be quite insignificant in terms of volume after six to 12 months. But I admittedly haven't CT scanned my composite cartilage craft patients with struts, but that's what we would guess just physiologically. So that's in place. And then we place the tympano meatal flap back down once again with the drum elevator, so that's tucked quite away anteriorly, and avoiding the round window, of course, and trying to avoid the eustachian tube, and then placing that back down with the drum elevator. We'll try and avoid the rosin needle and the sickle knife because it tends to spear the cartilage graft. You can see I'm having trouble with the drum elevator, so I actually switched to a short Thomason, quite a versatile instrument, and this will allow me to tuck the graft in a little bit better. You can see here it keeps flipping up, so the short Thomason does the job of tucking quite neatly down under that posterior inferior rim. And then we'll check the gap once again. And it's a small one millimeter gap now. So we'll use a thick perichondrium. And I'll demonstrate to you two methods of thick perichondrium placement. One is a folded graft where we're trying to close quite a large dead space between the lateral aspect of the cartilage graft and the rim of the perforation. So here it's important to use the sucker to evert the edges of the skin flap so we don't get any epithelial pearls as a secondary complication. And then we finish that off with the drum elevator so that the edges are very methodically averted from superior to postero inferior. So when I place my gel foams or my puristat in there, we won't get those epithelial pearls that are seen sometimes. And these still occur even if you do do this, but obviously there's less of them if you place it quite neatly back onto the original incision. And then we have the thick perichondrium that I'm cutting. 
And the first method of thick perichondrium insertion that I'll demonstrate to you is a folded graft for the bigger gap that's there. And we soak the perichondrial graft in topical siloxin. And then you'll see I place the graft in. And then I try and fold it so that it uh, provides a nice scaffold, a gentle scaffold for the epithelium to grow from the annulus region and from the margin of the perforation down onto the perichondrium of the composite cartilage graft. So you'll see here, I'm fiddling a bit, and of course there's a bit of luck here, but it folds quite neatly, neatly and luckily to sit in a nice position where you can see it fills that potential space between the graft and the perforation quite nicely. You'll see it rotates quite nicely into position just here. And we lay that down. And ensure whenever you're putting these perichondrial tuck grafts in that they always go under the epithelial edge of the perforation. So you can see that space is quite neatly closed here. But I'm not happy with the fact that there's the epithelial epithelium has to migrate over multiple surfaces. So after suctioning the region, I'll decide to demonstrate to you a tuck graft which covers the whole region. So I've taken a second piece of thick perichondrium just for demonstration purposes to cover that sort of ski slope that has a little bit of a bump on it. And theoretically and in practice, I find that the epithelium tends, tends to migrate more comfortably from that antero-superior edge down over the first piece of thick perichondrium and onto the composite cartilage graft. So once again, try and avoid using a rose needle or a sickle knife here, the drum elevator. Often this needs to be wet. I'd like to wet it with siloxin here because then you don't have it sticking to things and the surface tension provides some nice, a nice way of sealing things. And you can see here, I gently place that under the perforation, a slightly more gentle slope onto the thick perichondrium and composite cartilage graft. And this looks quite satisfactory now and it's ready for graft, place, uh, graft packing. And I use gel foam siloxin or pure uh, Purigen in the ear canal and you can see Simon has two four and six millimeter pieces prepared on a huckerback and once again a drum elevator or a gimmick is used to place this you can use cups or alligators or crocodiles all of the same and then I genuine generally just pack reasonably firmly in the anterior tympanomiatal angle and then relatively gently over the incision site but no more than that just up to the incision site and then a cotton ball with some clausig ointment and steri strips are used to close the ear canal. And this clausig is placed over the raw tragal wound. And generally we tell the patient to change this daily for three to five days until it stops bleeding. And then keep the air in there after that and leave the cotton ball out. And basically just use cotton ball with clausig or Vaseline for the three to four weeks until we see them in their first, po first post-operative appointment. And often the healing would have occurred by then. So thanks very much for listening through this long form video and let me know if you like this method and we'll do some more. Once again, everyone, thanks for watching.